The point of this morning's sermon is very simple. We need to understand what happened on that day, 2,000 years ago, on a hill outside Jerusalem. One man was crucified. And what was it? What happened then and what happened since? We need to know that. There are some facts, some hard questions we need to ask. What was the meaning of this death? Why do Christians sing bloody songs about a bloody cross? It is a bloody cross. There was nothing neat about it. Nothing neat about it. We have a cross on our, hanging on our neck these days, more like an ornament. But the real cross was bloody. It had the blood of Jesus on it. Why did this cross become a universal symbol for Christians, for Christianity? What was the real deal that day on that instrument of execution? That was the, the cross was just what would be an electric chair or gas chamber today. Nothing more special. What was it? These are just facts. But some of us seated here must be here with positive thoughts. You know, you have that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's only when I was coming up I realized, oh, even I'm dressed in black. There, uh, he's dressed in black. There's so many who are dressed in black. This was not deliberate. But I know many people on Good Friday choose to wear black or white. Why? Why not a colorful dress? Why not something to celebrate what Jesus did for us? Jesus hanging on that cross brings in some wonderful example of compassion and sacrifice. Some good thoughts about, let's look at, you're inspired to forgive and love. There's an overriding emotion of pity for Jesus, young man died in the prime of his life, a brutal death, how sad. Or just simply marvel at his martyrdom and unconditional love. These are just those general feelings that we have about the cross. But we haven't even started. If that's what you're sitting here with, we haven't even started. We still don't know what is the real deal. Have we lost it all, Juno? Okay. Let's look at the scriptures. What does the Bible say? <clears throat> Paul very clearly mentioned in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. He said, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Paul was not speaking his own words. He was quoting scripture from the Old Testament. He says, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, again he quotes, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That's Galatians 3. And this was actually for the church. He spoke this to the church, Paul. While the church had a different concept about the cross and about the curse. They understood the curse very well. Now here's what really happened on the cross. Jesus Christ set us free from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. I was listening to a series of monologues of different characters at the crucifix, a crucifixion. There was Peter, there was, um, there was the centurion, there was Simon of Cyrene. You remember that man, Simon of Cyrene? 
he was just a visitor to Jerusalem. He had come to take part with the, of the, with the Passover. And as the crowds thronged behind Jesus, suddenly one of the soldiers grabbed him and said, hey, you, carry the cross. Now, Simon didn't want to do that because Simon was here for a definite purpose. What was he here for? He was here to partake of the Passover. And suddenly the soldier grabs him and says, go, carry the cross with this man. And Simon was afraid if the blood of Jesus fell upon him, he would be unclean. He cannot be part of the Passover. But he had no choice. And Simon helped Jesus with the cross. And that's where he met Jesus, close quarters for the first time. He heard all the insults. He heard people speak ill about this man who actually was the Messiah. He felt spit upon his face. He felt the lashes. Part of it which fell upon Jesus fell a little on Simon as well. And Simon looked into the eyes of Jesus and he said, this man is not a liar. He's not a thief. He's not a fraud. He is the Messiah. And as they climbed up the hill, he had to let go of the cross because they were now going to nail him. And Simon couldn't watch this. And the monologue continues with this man standing and looking at this innocent man being nailed on the cross. And Simon says, that was the day when I helped Jesus carry my cross. It was not his cross. We sang it this morning in one of the Hindi songs. On that cross was written my name. That was the day when I helped Jesus carry my cross. That was the day when they nailed him on my cross, not his cross. My cross. There's a bad news though. <coughs> Our media does this, isn't it? Give you a bad news and then soon give you another good news. And so we are so confused. Well, let's do the bad news today. The bad news is death comes through self reliance. Death comes to us through self-reliance. Here's the problem as human beings. Verse 10 says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So is the law of God bad? Can we say that we should not have any laws? The law of God is a reflection of God's character. He's a just man on earth. Jesus came as man on earth. But God is just and his laws are righteous. We need them. But cursed is the man who relies on the law. The law is good. The problem is not with the law. The problem lies with those who rely on the law. Why? Why so? Because we just cannot keep it. We cannot keep the law. Try as much as you can. You cannot keep the law. How many of us seated here can say, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength and with everything that is in me. I love the Lord. How many of us can say that? How many of us can say that I love my neighbor just like me? How many of us can say when I look at the poor and the weak, I'm all out and filled with love and compassion. For them. How many of us can say that? We just cannot keep the law. Maybe someone sitting here is thinking, I can. That's what you think. You can keep some of the laws for some time. You can keep none of the laws all the time. That's the truth. The next, quest, the next excuse would be, hey, come on, I'm after all human. 
Sometimes I make a mistake. That's it. You break the law, you will be punished. If you rely on keeping the law, then it's going to be next to impossible to please God. Let's come to terms with that. Law keeping is impossible. What if I travel every single day with a regular railway pass? And then today, it happened to me today, I come to the station, I had to catch this train, and then I realize, ah, no pass. I need to buy a new one. What if I say, I'm late to church. It's okay. Today nobody is going to be there. And I get caught at church gate station. Can I just tell him, sir, so many years I have traveled. Never once I have traveled without a ticket. This is just once. Please excuse me. No, it doesn't work. Can I kick someone in his gut and steal his wallet and then say, so what, it's just once I pay my taxes every year. Can I do that? No. You cannot break the law. It is next to impossible for us to be law keepers. So then, I know what you're thinking, because I think like you. So why have laws at all? Why did God come up with all these laws? Why is God coming up so hard on laws then? Because he's God. He is God. He created us. He is the creator. He made us. And what God is good without laws? What parent is good if he is only going to say well done and encourage and inspire and uh, equip and never correct or punish? Which parent is good if he is like that? Which coach is good if he doesn't give him a feedback and challenge him to do better and have some standards? Which game is good without any rules? What kind of cricket will we play if there are no rules? If there are no mm, goals to reach or hit or whatever you call, whatever verb you have to use for that? What kind of coach would be Achari Karsar if all he did for Sachin was say, Sabash, good, good, good? First of all, he wouldn't have been Achari Karsar. He never said good to Sachin ever. You know that? He never said good to him, even when he played his best. That is God. He has laws, and we are expected to keep it. But the thing is, we are unable to keep it. We cannot keep these laws. And Paul quotes from the Old Testament, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. But there's a good news for us. What's the good news? The good news is we have life through execution. If you don't keep a, a law, you are punished, you are judged. What do we do? We have no chance. Hebrews, it's written that we have to die once and we have to face judgment. If that's the case, and as law keepers, we will never reach heaven, definite. Hell will be a crowded place. But the good news is life through execution. On the cross, Jesus took up the punishment. What happened in Genesis 3? That's very interesting to see. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. We worship an accur the, the accursed Christ. In Genesis 3, what happened? When they broke the law, Adam was cursed, Eve was cursed, the serpent was cursed, the ground was cursed, everything was cursed. You break the law, everything is cursed. They cast out of the Garden of Eden, and there was a, an angel with a flashing sword kept there. What happens in, further on in Genesis when 
God decides to bless Abraham. And he says, if you obey the commands, then I will bless you. And everybody who blesses you will be blessed. You know, somewhere else Paul says that some people say by the Spirit, Jesus is Lord. While there are others who, not of the Spirit, say, look, you worship a God that is cursed. He hung on the tree. They were mentioning this verse. He hung on the tree. He's a cursed God. How can you worship a cursed God? That Christ became a curse for us on Good Friday. But what was the curse if it didn't turn out to be a blessing? It's a blessing for us through the curse. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you have your Bibles, it's good for you to look at it. If you have to go through the huge chapter of blessings first and curses, it's very interesting to see. Everything written in Deuteronomy 28 in the beginning is blessings. You will have good harvest, you will have fruitful wombs, military success, peace, prosperity, your barns are full, you will have no diseases, there will be healing, you'll be blessed when you go in, when you come out. Everywhere there's blessing. But the second half of Deuteronomy 28 gives you an equally good list of curses. What are the curses? Same. You will be cursed when you go in, you come out, you'll have diseases, you will have no food, there'll be poverty, there'll be enemies will flourish and you will lose all your battles and there's curses and blessings. What happens at the end of our worship services? There's a benediction. Wilson is one of the regular fellows who come up and give us a benediction. And one of the best benedictions is in Numbers 6, verse 24. It says, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. What if it had to be curses? Interesting. The Lord curse you. The Lord forsake you. The Lord make his face frown upon you and be angry with you. The Lord turn his back upon you and give you wrath. And actually, this is what happened on the cross with Jesus. The Father turned his face away from the beloved Son. We have heard the voice thundering from above. This is my beloved son, and I am well pleased in him. And it's the same father who turns away his face, and the son cries out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was me that should have been there on that cross. It was my place that Jesus took. It was my cross that he carried. It was upon my cross that he was nailed. Isaiah 53 verses 5 and 6 says, He was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace. The punishment that he bore bought me peace today. And by his wounds, by every single one of those stripes, we stand healed today. We all like sheep have gone astray. And each one of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what happened on the cross that day. How do I respond to this 
unbelievable act of immense love. That's what it is. What was done for us on the cross is this unbelievable, immense act of love. The only way you can respond is with radical thanks on our lips and go out and show the same to our community. We heard that last week when Joe preached. We heard it. What are we doing for our community? Radical thanks. Why radical thanks? Because any given moment, if I do an exercise right now and say, list out all the things that you are unhappy about, every one of us will have, you know, many, many. I'm not happy with the roads, I'm not happy with the elections, right? I'm not happy with the traffic, I'm not happy with, with the police, I'm not happy with the hospitals, I'm not happy with so many things. That's where we need to say thank you. That's where we need to say thank you. We heard Neelu last Sunday came up, she went to a hospital and she came back thanking God. God said, thank me. Did you even thank me? That's what he asked her. Did you even thank me? We heard Ingrid this morning. Oh, I want to go home. I need my space. I need, I need my room. I can't stay with two sick women. But no. Did you even say thank you? That's what God would say. That's why it's written. A radical thanks. If you have written nothing in your blank sheet, the next line is what you need to write and underline and stick it up on your refrigerator for this week. A radical gratitude is the attitude of revolutionaries. You want to be a revolutionary? Be a thanksgiver. Radical thanksgiver. The radically grateful people are the ones who will become radical givers. You don't have to be rich to be a giver. When you can say thank you, you'll be able to give. Because Jesus said, he didn't say if you have 10 coats, give one. He said if you have two. Lord, what will I wear when I wash this one? Don't worry about that. If you have two, give away one. And if you have 10, you know what to do. Give away nine. All right. I like telling stories. This is a fantastic story. This is a real story. I wish I could say she's part of this church and that church. No, I don't know. I don't even know if she goes to a church. But this is a true story. And her name is Ganga. Ganga is a poor woman who lives is a middle-aged woman. He's, she's a coolie, a daily wage laborer who lives in a small hut somewhere in the middle of a field in North Karnataka. North Karnataka is not as green as the other parts of Karnataka. It's fairly dry, rocky, dusty terrain. And Ganga is a daily wage laborer she goes to work every day. She lives in a little hut, a shack, alone. She doesn't have a lock for her hut. There's nothing of great value to steal, so she just pulls this thatched door that she has and goes off to work every morning. Um, she has to look for work every morning. It may be just breaking uh, rocks into little stones or it may be in a field or whatever. She goes every day, looks for work, comes back at the end of the day. She doesn't have water in her hut, so she has to walk about half a kilometer or more to the common bore well, which has a tap. She needs to use the hand pump, pump and fetch water for herself. She brings it back every evening, one or two buckets of water. She has her bath cooks a small, simple meal, eats it, goes to bed. Her life is so uncomplicated. She's very happy if she has a job every day. The days she doesn't have work, she's lonely and bored, she has nothing much to do. So that is Ganga. And one day when she comes back home and just getting ready for her evening meal, she hears an old man outside 
looks out. It's an old beggar. Ganga says, go away. I haven't even started cooking. And even if I finish cooking, there's very little food. I don't have anything to give you. Go away. The old man stands there and she, he says, I don't want any food. Can you give me a bucket of warm water? I need to have a bath. Ganga is annoyed. That's worse than water, worse than food. I hardly bought two buckets of water for myself. The old man says, I'll go away if you're not giving me some water, but I don't want any food. My body is full of sores and itchy. The heat and the dust makes it difficult for me to sleep. You are a very well-off woman. You have a hut, you have some vessels, you have firewood, you have water. I have none of these. Can you please give me some water? Ganga was shocked. Nobody had ever said this to her, that she is well off. Nobody had called her a rich woman. Nobody had said, please give me. Turned her heart. She quickly got up, abandoned her cooking plans, warmed up the water for him, gave him a bucket of water. The old man went outside, washed himself, used a piece of stone and scrubbed his body, changed into another set of torn, tattered clothes, rinsed out his dusty clothes that he was wearing, came back, gave her the empty bucket and blessed her, said, bless you. Again, Ganga was shocked. Nobody had blessed her in all her life. She lives alone. The next day she comes back from work. Lo and behold, the old man is waiting for his bucket of warm water. She gives it to him the second day. The third day she wakes up in the morning. She has a goal. She not only fetches water for herself, but brings in an extra bucket knowing that he will come back in the evening. A week later, it carried on. The old man comes every evening, has his bath, and then on his way out, no food, no nothing, just needs a bucket of warm water for a bath, blesses her and goes away. One of her friends says, you know what? My son has a cycle. I'll ask him to bring some pots of water for you. Another old man at the well says, you know what, I have an old drum. I'll lend it to you. He brings it for her. Somebody else says, I have one more. Suddenly there's a surge of philanthropy in the village. And there are people who go in to collect their, their quota of water, but on the way up or down, they donate one bucket of water for Ganga. After the first week, the old man comes back, not alone. He comes back with two other friends. To cut the long story short, a few weeks later, Ganga had this whole massive community bath thing going on outside her house. This is a true story, friends. She had about 30 to 40 men lining up every day. And there were people who were giving her, the, the, by the way, the first old man tells her at the end of the first week, I cannot carry water for you. I'm very old and frail. But during the day, I'm going to collect some dry leaves and twigs so that you can use it to warm my bucket of water. So now there were people in the village contributing drums, uh, pots of water, um, kindle, uh, for lighting the fire, firewood, and Ganga was still going to work every day. One of the leading industrialists of our country heard about this, and he, this was becoming big news, so he drove down to Ganga's uh, turf in his BMW, and then said, fantastic, this is wonderful, this is a brilliant project. Um, good work. I think we need to add in some antiseptic soap bars and a few hundred towels. This will make this project 
neater, better. This is what Ganga said to this industrialist, which is the best part of my story. She says, I still go to work every day. I still don't lock my hut. I do this because I love it. It gives me an opportunity to serve people like me who have nothing. I don't spend any money on this. In this dusty place, skin diseases are very common. A bath a day keeps the skin doctor away. I don't do anything. I only do the little that I can. In the meantime, there were women, and so Ganga makes a special uh, little enclosed area for women to have their bath. And all of this is makes the coconut leaves, dry coconut leaves, she makes walls for this little bath uh, cubicle. So now she's done it within her own ability. And she says, I have no need for soaps and towels. Because if you give me soaps and towels, I'll have to first go and buy a lock and key and look after this. Then maybe they will say, we want hammam, we want life boy, we want chandrika, we want dove soap. That becomes a problem. If I lose the towels, I'll have to give you an account for it. If you want to give them soaps or towels, be my guest. But you do it. This is how far God has equipped me. I need no money. All of them bless me. The ones Abraham's blessing was what? The one who blesses Abraham will be also blessed. Ganga's Ghat. It became known as Ganga's Ghat. Ganga had nothing to do. Just give what she had within herself. If you are one who says, I'm just a woman, I'm just a man, I'm just a girl, what can I do? I don't have a salary. I can't do anything. Look around. Ganga had nothing. Nothing. She was so true and so real to herself because she was annoyed. She was annoyed the first time the old man came. She was absolutely annoyed. If the cross of Christ isn't your everyday fuel, the fire you warm your heart around, then you will grow cold. If you think the cross is a doorway for me to get in, wrong. The cross has to be the very air that you breathe in. Every single day I need to wake up and say, thank you, Lord. If not for this cross, I would be nothing. How does the cross compel our daily living? This is what we need to think about. My disciplines like prayer and Bible reading or regular routine of fasting and worship. How does the cross change the way we view our jobs? Is it a job? Is it a vocation? Or is it an opportunity for me to be a blessing? He bore that curse upon the cross so that I would become a blessing. Not once in a while. Not once in a while. That is the challenge I am experiencing every day. I have to be a blessing every moment. If I am known the light as the light and salt, then wherever I am, there should be light. I cannot afford to spread darkness. How does the cross change the way we view our jobs, our vocations throughout the day, as well as the way we relax and rest at the end of the day? This is the challenge. What if any unique effect does the cross have on the ways we spend our time, set our priorities, make our decisions, and love our neighbors. So how do we do that? How does the cross of Christ inevitably enable us to do that? That's the challenge for us. Can I be a Ganga? 
Can I be one who will bless people along my peers? I could never say I am saved and the world is perishing. No. They need it as much as I need it. And that's the challenge we have. The accursed Christ that we worship this morning is the one who has enabled us to be a blessing to this world. Father, we thank you this morning that you bore the cross for us upon that cross. We thank you, O oh God, that on that instrument of execution, you set us free. You not only set us free from curse, but you also equipped us strong enough to be a blessing in this community that you have placed us. Son of God, we worship you this morning. Son of God, we bless you this morning. Son of God, we thank you. We thank you for so willingly carrying our cross and so willingly being nailed upon that cross that we may be free today. In Jesus' name.